Good day and welcome to today's presentation. Please note this webinar is being recorded. All participants are in a listen-only mode. If you would like to ask a question, please enter it into the Q&A panel located at the bottom of your screen. It is now my pleasure to turn the call over to Lisa Sullivan. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lisa Sullivan, and I am looking forward to a wonderful event today. We are very pleased to have you joining us for the comprehensive National Nursing Home Training. Today is the fourth time out of five times we are offering this comprehensive training session. A couple reminders before we get started. For the compliance slides and recording from today's session will be posted to the QIO program website, which is now in the chat box if you need that URL. During the open discussion period, please keep in mind that we will get to as many questions and comments as time permits, but if there are any unanswered questions, we will address those as well during our post-event. Along with our speakers today, we also have colleagues from CDC and CMS Division of Nursing Homes available to answer some of your questions. And I want to thank our colleagues for being available to assist us during the question and answer portion of today's event. Please also know that we will have a post-event survey that will be shared via a link during Q&A. You will also have an opportunity to complete the post-event survey immediately following the conclusion of today's training. Please do complete that survey for us. We value your feedback on how we can make these and other training opportunities better. And again, thank you for taking the time today to be with, here, be with us here. Next slide, please. I'd like to introduce our four speakers we have today. The first one is Eli DeLille, Deb Smith, Gina Partington, and Susan Purcell. Our first speaker will be Eli DeLille from HSAG. Mr. DeLille serves as an infection preventionist with more than 16 years of experience in the healthcare industry with expertise in quality improvement, analysis and implementation of performance improvement, patient safety initiatives, and direct patient care. Mr. DeLille earned a master's degree in nursing from Marshall University. He is certified in infection control and is a fellow with the Association of Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology. I would now like to turn over the call to Eli DeLille. Eli, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Lisa, for the introduction as well as the opportunity to be here and talk about such an important topic. Next slide, please. I'm going to be tough covering how to establish an IP program as well as conduct ongoing infection surveillance in the nursing home. Next slide. Some key elements of infection prevention include developing a system for preventing, identifying, reporting, investigating, and controlling infection and communicable diseases for all residents, staff members, and visitors. And this is so important right now in such a complex, dynamic, situation that I really feel like um, probably infection prevention in the nursing home is one of the most challenging professions anyone could go into. So you're all heroes that are on the line right now. Um, we want to talk today about some tools and resources that are going to help you establish goals and priorities for your program, as well as how you can plan and implement strategies to achieve your goals, monitor compliance, and respond to identified issues. Next slide. I can't really talk about infection prevention without talking about the importance of educating your new IP or your experienced IP. As an administrator, director of nursing um, within a nursing home, setting aside time for your IP to take training will make them more successful and your facility more successful in keeping your residents COVID naive. So the designated IP lead should complete the CDC infection prevention training. This training was really designed for working staff members. It's a series of 19 modules that they can take on demand um, when they have time to take it, with some modules being as short as 15 minutes long. So even the busiest infection preventionists can find the time to work through this training. You just have to make sure that they are taken out of the workflow enough that they're not interrupted because it's going to make that training so much more valuable for them. Next slide. As good as the CDC training is, we have noticed that it doesn't completely acclimate the new IP or even experienced IP for their role. So at my company, we're fortunate to have four infection preventionists that have 50 plus years of experience. And we sat down as a group and created a document that helps to orient that new infection preventionist. It standardizes the essential components of a program. And if you're a 
a facility that's still COVID naive, you're well staffed, you have that full time infection preventionist, this is going to work for you. But also, if you have a designated lead, but you're having to split those duties between one, two, three, or even more staff members, you want to ensure that there's some consistency in the responses that are being provided to staff when they ask questions. Um, we all have a different background. Um, there's people all the way from public health to nursing that work in infection prevention. And we have to make sure that those answers are consistent. This defined criteria in simple format surveyors love as well as administrators because they can easily pull this out and show how you took that extra time to make sure that your infection prevention as well was well oriented to their role. Next slide. Once your infection preventionist has a good understanding of the fundamentals of infection prevention, it's time for them to go out and start seeing if there's a disconnect between their policy and process. And we're fortunate that the CDC has come up with multiple documents to help the new IP or even the experienced IP do this. There's a full facility infection prevention assessment that's known as a facility ICAR, but then we understand that COVID-19 is at the forefront of everyone's thoughts right now, so they have a more uh, structured assessment for COVID uh, processes within your facility. Initially, this was designed for public health officials to do remotely or on site, and then they would provide a feedback report. But what we've discovered is this is the perfect self-assessment for a nursing home to go out and see if there is any opportunities to keep COVID out or to control COVID if it is within your facility. It breaks it down into five different pieces. Um, we encourage this to be done at least on a monthly basis. Um, but if you're dealing with a, a very significant concern, you could always do it more frequently just to make sure that you're being compliant uh, with all the necessary processes. Next slide. So once you've done your assessment, you're likely going to be faced with some opportunities for improvement. I don't think in eight years of being an infection preventionist, I've ever gone out and looked for problems and not found some. Um, so what you want to do is under this action plan, which our company has developed, uh, we have one for pandemic events, but also we have them from antibiotic stewardship all the way to vaccination. So if you're looking for a place to get started, this is posted on the QIO website, and we're always happy to take questions or help um, you navigate through this process. So very simply, you put your survey findings. This could be from the state, the federal, or your own assessment and how that feeds into your best practices. So you want to make sure that you're correlating those best practices to your identified concern. We have some general ones listed here for you as a guide, but you're going to want to make sure that that reflects your local and state recommendations as well. In California, which is one of the states we operate in, we're fortunate to have a mitigation plan requirement. Um, and this is a great document that just kind of has a detailed step-by-step -step instructions on how a nursing home can approach um, infection prevention and COVID-19 mitigation. So you, if you haven't checked out that document, it's a great thing to take a look at. You always want to make sure that you're assigning responsibility. And with infection prevention, we're, in, we're responsible for a lot, but not necessarily in charge of departments. So you always have to make sure that you get your, your nursing partners, your providers, and your administrators to make sure that the, the people that hold staff accountable are, are a crucial part of any improvement activity. You need to have a date started. What we hope to find is, is when you do your assessment uh, that there's not a huge amount of time before you start implementing those improvement activities because something seemingly simple right now we're finding could have catastrophic effects uh, within the nursing home. So you want to make sure that date is listed here. And then also, as you're looking at that date, you're going to correlate it to your outcome measures. Nursing homes are required to report COVID-19 through NHSN to the federal government on a weekly basis. And what you can do is, is, as long as your numbers are trending at zero for your residents, let's say you start noticing that it's in your community, you start having staff come positive. Well, that's when you really have to make sure that your infection prevention processes are on point so that they don't transmit to your residents. Making sure your staff are washing their hands appropriately, that they're doing environmental cleaning, that they're donning and doffing their personal protective equipment, that they're wearing their masks when they should, is an absolutely vital piece of keeping your, co your facility COVID naive. And you want to report compliance monitoring. And this isn't just education and letting everyone know that you educated 100% of your staff. You have to go out and make sure that the education took, that your staff are actually doing what you expect of them. And the compliance monitoring is a great way to show um, your facility, your team, how you've pulled all these pieces together and that the the interventions and compliance monitoring is what's contributing to uh, the prevention of COVID. Next slide, please. 
no plan can be completed in isolation, and that's a mistake I made early on in my career. Uh, you have to make sure that you're soliciting feedback, and this is a way for you to increase engagement and then also create champions for your infection prevention program out there in the unit. We have some people listed here, um, but within your particular facility, you know who those formal and informal leaders are. So making sure that they are a part of your team is really gonna set you up for success. You wanna make sure that you educate staff regarding expectations of care. So this is the what you want them to do but also the why behind it. If they don't understand why you're asking them to do something, there's a lot more likelihood that they're not gonna take it um, into their daily practice. And the more they understand how important it is, what they're doing right now, the more likely they're gonna be following the best practice recommendations that you're setting out in front of them. You wanna make sure that you empower your staff to speak up if they identify a concern. And that means that if they're out in the unit and they notice a provider not masking or gloving or donning their piece personal protective equipment. If they don't feel comfortable talking to them at that moment, I know that can be an intimidating situation, then they have to be able to come back to you and have you escalate that concern and know that you're gonna handle that for them. You wanna make sure that you're modifying your plan as necessary. And this is something also for the new IP. I, I love my plans when I come up with them. I think they're perfect, but often it's a, it's a blow to your ego if you realize you forgot something or you missed something. Well. As dynamic as the environment is that we're all working in, recommendations are changing on a daily basis. If you're doing the COVID-19 assessments within your facility uh, frequently, the likelihood that your plan is gonna have to change just as frequently is pretty high. But what's great is you just note the date, when the new strategies were added, who is responsible, and you just keep that rolling into your QAPI plan. So you have a clear idea of exactly what you did uh, to prevent COVID from spreading within your facility. Next slide, please. I mentioned before that we have a tremendous amount of resources. These are all available on the Quality Improvement uh, website. CMS asks that anything we presented today, that you would be able to take it immediately and use it within your organization. So uh, we're fortunate to have these posted, um, and they're encouraging everyone to check those out. Next slide. And one more. Unfortunately, IPRO couldn't be here today, so I've been asked to present their slides, and they're gonna talk about COVID-19 surveillance and early detection in the nursing home. Next slide. And it focuses primarily on the CDC's three key steps, and that's keeping COVID-19 out of the facility with your screening protocols, detecting cases quickly with your testing and symptom-based screening, and then stopping transmission with your cohorting, your isolation precautions, hand hygiene, and many of the other things that we're gonna talk about today. Next slide. So IPRO focused very much on the feedback from their partners so that we wanna share best practices that they've learned along the way. And one of the things that they've really focused on is managing staff at the door. And to the extent possible, the screening needs to occur exterior to the building whenever possible, but if it can't happen, you need to make sure that you're using a consistent format when you screen um, your staff coming into the building or your or visitors um, if it's an end of life situation. Instead of just saying, are you having any symptoms of COVID-19, open it up and say, are you having a cough? Have you had a fever? Have you had an exposure? Because what we're discovering is many staff don't understand just how um, subtle the signs and symptoms of COVID-19 can be. You wanna check staff more frequently. Um, one of the speakers later today is going to talk that, you know, uh, COVID-19 symptoms can develop very quickly and they can have a very dramatic change in acuity. So even in your staff, we may be seeing this. So if you're having extended shifts, it's a good idea to touch base periodically. You want to self-assess at the end of your shift. Unfortunately, in California, there's been a few instances of evacuations related to staffing concerns. And if you have additional time to find someone to help cover that shift, it's really a thing that you can be more proactive than reactive about. Remember that well-trained non-direct care staff um, have an ability to assist you during this difficult time. They just need to be trained appropriately if they're operating in a role that they may not be accustomed to. And then you wanna stagger your shifts as well so that you're not creating traffic jams. Socially distancing from one another as well as source control is very important. And right now we're hearing that people are all coming at the same time and congregating at entrances, trying to get the screens out of the way and it's putting people at risk. Next slide. 
at an operational level as a facility, you need to make sure that you're encouraging your staff um, to stay home and not come to work when they're ill. Uh, we've had several instances where our nursing home partners have said, you know, the staff had a, a family member that tested positive for COVID-19. They didn't want to tell us because they knew that there was no one else to cover that shift. Well, they have to recognize that the risk that they bring in the home outweighs the benefit of them coming into work and that ultimately finding someone else to work is going to be the best thing for your organization. Consider changing your shift pattern to 12 hours if you are faced with a shortage because that will eliminate a third shift and help take those staff members and work them into the general um, staffing matrix. Agency staff are reality right now, as well as staff members working in two, three different buildings. And if that is occurring, you need to know who those people are, what facilities they're working in, and to the extent possible, limit that as much as you can. In one instance, we had a nursing home that the, uh, a nurse was working at two facilities that had an outbreak, and then she was also working in a third that was still COVID naive. So the COVID naive facility chose to not have her come back in just because the risk was associated with her. So you just have to have those frank conversations and figure out what's best for your organization. You need to be prepared for those staffing shortages. And I know many local uh, health departments as well as state health departments are assisting with that. But also ask about volunteers. In California, we're fortunate to have a group of retired doctors, nurses, and infection preventionists waiting to go in and help nursing homes that are in trouble. So just explore every one of these avenues within your facility so you have a good idea of who you can rely on in the event of an emergency. Next slide. Communication is extremely important right now, and we're living in a, you know, technology is a marvel, WebEx platforms, virtual visits, and I don't think we're taking as much advantage of this in some instances as possible. And when we have residents that are scared, staff, family, uh, it's important to communicate frequently, um, not just when you have a new resident uh, or a new staff member come positive, but in general about what you're doing to keep COVID out of your facility. It's going to reassure those people, um, not just in your staff, but in your community, that you're taking every step possible to protect your residents. We're also hearing about limited uh, vendor access. Often these are individuals that enter your facility and nobody's aware of them. They're delivery people, they're food service trucks. And these individuals are going from facility to facility. There's a high risk of transmission, and we need to make sure if they are coming into your building, that they are doing source control, hand hygiene, and meeting all the expectations to safely enter your building. And then have a clear return to work policy. I mentioned before the concern about um, having staff members uh, working if they're ill. Well, you also wanna know when your staff can safely come back because we don't wanna extend a shortage for any longer than what we absolutely have to. Next slide. I'm not really gonna go into testing because we're gonna cover this in additional detail, but as you look at detecting cases quickly in residents, you have to make sure that you've got good screening processes in place. And that includes daily rounds. And we have many of our facilities that have gone to taking vital signs, not just once per shift, but twice per shift just an abundance of caution. You wanna make sure that you're meeting more frequently with your team so that you can have that touch base. With the elderly, um, especially our immune compromised residents, we know that their symptoms, it may take them, they may be late in the progression of their illness before they start having a fever. And by that point, their acuity level could have changed drastically. And a great way to do that is spot check more frequently their vital signs. Be willing to talk more frequently as well with mid-shift huddles. That's also a great time for your IT, your ADON, your director of nursing, your administrator to get out and start doing some assessments. The IP can't do it all on their own. So having everyone using the same tools and educating when they find noncompliance is gonna really reinforce that this is a priority within your organization. And then I've been a nurse for 20 plus years now, and you wanna make sure that you're back to basics and you're using those good assessment skills uh, when you're working with your residents. We know um, that things change, can change very quickly and it's that, that subtle identification and your willingness to escalate concerns that's gonna potentially save that resident's life as well as prevent unnecessary exposure within the nursing home. Next slide, please. And then finally, our goal is to stop transmission. I'm gonna go into this a little bit and then the rest of the presentation is really about stopping transmission as well. So as we're washing our hands, we wanna make sure that we're washing the resident hands that if we're taking things from one area in the building to another, we wanna minimize that as much as possible, but if there's no choice, then we're cleaning those items to make sure that they're safe. 
uh, we need to make sure that we engage our residents as much as possible in their own care. If you have somebody that's requesting to clean their environment, they're mentally alert, um, they can take the education that comes along with it and it makes them feel more secure. We can, we can engage them as much as possible as long as we do it in a safe way. We also want to make sure that we fight the depression and the anxiety that's coming along with residents being restricted. And IPRO put some fun ways that you can do that here. Next slide, please. Here's some resources from the presentation. And then next slide. I want to thank Marguerite and David for the opportunity to present on their behalf today and turn it back over to Lisa uh, for the next presenter. Thank you. Thanks so much, Eli. Next slide, please. It is now my pleasure to introduce Deb Smith from Health Quality Innovators. Ms. Smith has more than 20 years of experience as an infection preventionist, registered nurse, and ASCP registered microbiology technician. Ms. Smith is a member of the Virginia chapter of APIC. She also holds her certification in infection control, and she's a certified professional in healthcare quality. Deb, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lisa. Next slide, please. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for taking the time today to join us on this presentation. So my topic is cohorting as a core intervention of an infection prevention program, and it's currently being utilized during the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. The goal of cohorting or isolation is to prevent the transmission of microorganisms from infected, colonized, and or asymptomatic residents to other resident staff or visitors who may in turn transmit them to others or become infected or colonized themselves. Residents infected or colonized with the same infectious agent can be cohorted together to prevent spreading that infection to other non-infected residents. Staff are included in cohorting during outbreak situations like the COVID-19 pandemic to a specific cohort of infected residents, which will further limit the risk of spreading infection in your facility. Next slide, please. To contain disease during the COVID-19 pandemic, the CDC outlines a plan for nursing homes to create a COVID care unit in their facility that can be dedicated to care for residents with confirmed COVID-19. This COVID care unit should be physically separated from the rest of the facility and be in place before the first suspected or confirmed COVID-19 cases. The COVID care unit can be a dedicated floor, unit, or wing in your facility, or a group of rooms at the end of the unit that's separated by a barrier and will be used to cohort residents with COVID-19. Nursing staff should be dedicated to work on the COVID care unit when it is in use. If ancillary staff cannot be dedicated to the COVID care unit, they should be restricted from entering the unit. Next slide, please. There should be posted signage at the entrance to the COVID care unit instructing all who enter the unit to wear eye protection and an N95 or higher level respirator at all times while they are on that unit. Following the CDC's PPE optimization strategy, a face mask could be used when respirators are unavailable. But cloth face coverings are not considered PPE and should be not be worn when PPE is indicated. Gowns and gloves should be added when entering resident rooms to perform resident care. Provide infection prevention training that includes the use of and steps to properly put on and remove recommended personal protective equipment. Resident care equipment should be assigned and dedicated to the COVID care unit. Cleaning and disinfection of shared equipment should be performed between resident care and this equipment should not leave the COVID care unit. Next slide, please. You'll need to assess your on-site and remote staffing capabilities to assure that you have adequate clinical and non-clinical staff with the required training skills and competencies in place for staffing the COVID care unit. These assigned and cohorted staff should not work across other units, floors, or facilities. If your facility does not have enough ancillary staff to dedicate to the COVID care unit, your nursing staff may need to perform other duties like housekeeping and dietary tasks, so they will need education in those areas. 
Whenever possible, it's recommended that nursing homes integrate consistent assignment of staff to specific residents, with the goal being to decrease the number of staff and resident interactions. Staff access between the COVID unit and the rest of the facility should be limited as much as possible. This can be accomplished by providing a separate entrance and dedicating break areas and supply rooms for the COVID care cohorted staff. Next slide, please. Keeping the resident and the family informed of the cohorting process is the first step in managing your residents with COVID-19 symptoms. Residents in the facility who develop symptoms consistent with COVID-19 should be prioritized for testing and moved to a single room pending the results of that testing. They should not be placed in a room with a new admission and they should not be moved to the COVID care unit until they are confirmed to have COVID-19 by testing. Roommates of residents with COVID-19 may be exposed and should be considered infectious and moved to a single room or observation area. You can cohort potentially exposed residents in an observation area only if single rooms are not available. Residents with known or suspected COVID-19 should be cared for using all recommended PPE, which includes the use of an N95 or higher level respirator, eye protection, gloves, and gown. Next slide, please. If your facility is receiving new admissions or readmissions who had been confirmed to have COVID-19, you will need to carefully assess each resident for placement in your facility. If criteria for discontinuation of transmission precautions has not been met, they would be admitted to the COVID care unit. If they have met the criteria for discontinuation of precautions, they can be admitted to the regular unit. When admitting residents with unknown COVID-19 status, they would not be cohorted on the COVID care unit, but they would be placed in a single room or in a separate observation area so that that resident can be monitored for evidence of COVID-19. Staff should wear all recommended COVID-19 PPE when caring for these residents. Residents can be transferred out of the observation area to the main facility if they remain afebrile and without symptoms for 14 days after their admission. Next slide, please. You will continue transmission precautions and cohorting for all symptomatic and asymptomatic COVID-19 positive residents until criteria for discontinuation is met. So the criteria on this slide are the CDC recommended strategies for discontinuation of precautions for symptomatic and asymptomatic residents. It's important to remember though that if your state or local regulations are stricter and include a longer duration, you must follow those stricter regulations. If a symptomatic resident declines or is unable to be tested, you would continue transmission-based precautions until the symptom-based criteria are met. Next slide, please. And finally, contaminated healthcare facility surface, surfaces play an important role in the transmission of microorganisms, and this is including COVID-19. Therefore, appropriate cleaning and disinfection of surfaces and equipment which residents and staff touch is necessary to reduce exposure and to minimize the risk of cross-infection from one person or object to another. Environmental cleaning during COVID-19, especially in the COVID care unit, should be enhanced and include at the minimum daily room cleaning of all high-touch surfaces more frequently. Refer to the list of approved disinfectants to assure that your facility is using the right product the correct way. Next slide, please. In closing today, I'd like to mention that each of your facilities are unique and that you may need to adapt these recommendations to your facility. These adaptations will rely on your access to PPE, the available space in your facility, and the number of COVID positive residents you currently have. You can always reach out to your QIN, QIO in your state or to your state or local health department for assistance with any of these unique situations that you encounter. So thank you for your time today. My contact information is on this slide and I'm gonna turn the program back to Lisa. Thank you, Deb. Next slide, please. 
I would now like to introduce our next speaker, Gina Partington, Program Director from Alliant Quality. Ms. Partington has been with Alliant Quality for six years and is the Program Director for Alabama, Florida, and Louisiana. Ms. Partington is double board certified in healthcare quality improvement and patient safety. She has worked in the quality improvement field for over 20 years. Gina, you are welcome to begin. Thank you, Lisa. Today, I would like to cover three important aspects of clinical care for COVID positive residents for your staff as they provide care to the most vulnerable people in your communities. Number one, Residents with COVID-19 can have very different disease progressions. Number two, the importance of having care plans in place that align with residents' goals and preferences before they become sick. And number three, the need to work with medical directors to make sure that necessary medications are available. Next slide, please. As you know, COVID-19 is a new virus and we are continuing to learn more about it and its effects on the human body as time goes on. We still believe that most residents will develop symptoms within two to 14 days after exposure. What is changing is that early on, we focused more on respiratory symptoms from COVID-19, such as difficulty breathing, cough, sore throat, and fever, chills, or runny nose. Over time, we have been recognizing that the symptoms can actually be much less specific, such as headaches, tiredness, muscle aches, loss of taste or sense of smell. Whereas we used to think COVID-19 as a respiratory disease, we are now thinking of it as a blood vessel disease. And that means that COVID-related symptoms are actually much broader and may not be very specific. If we then think about the clinical course, this is where we see such differences in disease progression. Some residents will have no symptoms, some will have only minor symptoms, and some will have minor symptoms for one to two weeks and then become critically ill very suddenly. This is why the CDC recommends more frequent monitoring of residents with COVID-19, even if they have no symptoms or very mild symptoms. Next slide, please. We are also learning that many residents will not have any of the classic COVID-19 symptoms. Instead, it is very common to see residents that only have subtle nonspecific symptoms such as tiredness, change in alertness, slowly eating and drinking less. There may be a slow downhill course over several weeks. The changes may be subtle. So it is important that staff is very familiar with the residents in their care. In these chaotic times with staffing changes and resident cohorting, there may be different staff members caring for an individual resident. If consistent assignment is not possible, then it is critical that staff has standardized communication strategies, which is important in any event, but much more so when you have varied assignments. We are also finding that COVID-19 is associated with blood clots and strokes. This means that some residents may develop altered mental status as their main COVID symptom with mild or no other obvious symptoms. Next slide, please. Moving on to the second point, ensuring that appropriate care plans are in place to respect residents' goals and preferences. Advanced care planning is important for all residents, but it is especially important in the era of COVID-19. As noted earlier, some residents with COVID-19 have minor symptoms for several days or weeks, then suddenly become acutely ill. It is very important to have conversations about care preferences and to document those preferences long before a resident becomes sick and decisions have to be made quickly. The main question here is whether the resident wants to be transferred to the hospital. As you know, at this time, we do not have an effective treatment for mild or moderate COVID-19 symptoms. What we can do is provide supportive care as the virus runs its course. Ventilator support for acute distress and breathing is available in a hospital, but the experience from New York shows very high mortality rates for older persons put on ventilators 
with COVID-19. For those put on a ventilator, the mortality rate was 80% for people over the age of 80, and the mortality rate was 75% for those younger than 80, but with underlying medical conditions. So doing advanced care planning ensures that the resident's care preferences can be honored if a health crisis develops. Next slide. Finally, in thinking about what resources you have in your facility, it is important to work with your medical directors to make sure that all necessary medications will be available. Consider having standard standing orders for acetaminophen, supplemental oxygen, and discontinuing any non-essential medications. Be sure that staff are trained in proper resident positioning to improve breathing. If possible, change nebulizers to metered dose inhalers to decrease the risk of COVID-19 transmission from an infected resident to staff. Be sure that concentrated opioids are available in case they are needed for severe shortness of breath symptoms. If a resident is in distress, you do not want them to have to wait several hours until a medication can be made available from a pharmacy. And lastly, I want to point you to the CDC resource at this link. It is a comprehensive source of information about how to evaluate and manage residents with symptoms of COVID-19. The information is updated frequently as we continue to learn more about this disease. Thank you, and I turn it back over to you, Lisa. Thanks, Gina. As a reminder, if you have any questions you would like to have answered during our Q&A session, please click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type them in, and you don't have to wait till the end for that. Next slide, please. It is now my pleasure to introduce Susan Purcell from TMF Quality Innovation Network. Ms. Purcell has been a registered nurse for 34 years, working in critical care, home health, hospice, and nursing management. Ms. Purcell has been with the QIO for over 16 years, leading quality improvement projects in case review, nursing homes, hospitals, and outpatient settings. Susan, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Lisa. And thank you to Telogen, the Quinn QIO, who originally authored this presentation. Next slide. The objective of this PPE presentation is to provide you with why and how to use PPE and give you links to resources that can be helpful. You will see that I've included numerous links throughout the slides for more in-depth information. And there is information in the chat about attaining the slides. Next slide. PPE is specialized clothing or equipment worn by an employee for protection against infectious materials. Next slide. We use PPE to protect ourselves, our residents, and others in the process of performing care including protection from dangerous or infectious substances. Next slide. Listed here are types of PPE commonly used by healthcare providers. Gloves are the most common type of PPE that is used in healthcare settings, and all of these serve to help keep us safe. Next slide. Based upon the CDC guidelines, PPE is to be used every day by all healthcare personnel to protect themselves, residents, and others when providing care. This also includes your activities personnel, environmental services, dietary, administrative staff, hospice, repairmen, etc. There are instances where residents must wear PPE for protection, including attending doctor's appointments. More detailed information is available at the CDC link provided here under the tab Infection Control Guidance. Next slide. PPE must be donned correctly before entering the resident area and must remain in place and be worn correctly for the duration of work in potentially contaminated areas. PPE should not be adjusted, such as retying of gowns or adjusting the respirator or face mask during resident care, and must be removed slowly and deliberately in a sequence that prevents self-contamination. 
Have a PPE buddy system in case assistance is needed. A step-by-step -step process should be developed and used during training and during resident care. Next slide. For more information on the proper use of PPE, I highly recommend this CDC link. There are posters in both English and Spanish that can be used for staff education as well as videos for education purposes. I'll go over some of their guidance now. Next slide. Standard precautions are used for all resident care and transmission-based precautions are used when caring for those with known or suspected COVID-19 infections. Proper donning, doffing, and use is necessary to prevent self and cross-contamination. So I'll go over those in more detail. Next slide. More than one donning method may be acceptable. Training and practice using your facility's procedure is critical. This is one example of proper donning. Identify and gather the proper PPE to don. Ensure the choice of gown size is correct. Perform hand hygiene. Put on the isolation gown. Tie all of the ties on the gown. Assistance may be needed by your PPE buddy. Put on your N95 filtering face piece respirator or use a face mask if a respirator is not available. If the respirator has a nose piece, it should be fitted to the nose with both hands, not bent or tented. Do not pinch the nose piece with one hand. Respirator or face mask should be extended under the chin. Both your mouth and nose should be protected. Do not wear a respirator or face mask under your chin or store in your pocket between residents. Put on your face shield or goggles. When wearing a respirator, select the proper eye protection to ensure that the respirator does not interfere with the correct positioning of the eye protection and the eye protection does not affect the fitter seal of the respirator. Face shields provide full face coverage. Goggles also provide excellent protection for the eyes, but fogging is common. Next, put on gloves. Gloves should cover the cuff or the wrist of the gown. Now you're ready to enter the residence area to provide care. Be aware of your surroundings and what you're touching. Next slide. This picture from CDC shows fully and appropriately donned PPE. Next slide. Removing PPE, also known as doffing, is an equally important practice to prevent self or cross-contamination. Start with removing gloves. Ensure that glove removal does not cause additional contamination of the hands. Next, remove the gown. Untie all the ties or snaps. Some gown uh, ties can be broken rather than untied. Do so in a gentle manner, avoiding a forceful movement. Reach up to the shoulders and carefully pull the gown down and away from the body. Rolling the gown down is an acceptable approach. Dispose in an appropriate receptacle. Exit the room or area and perform hand hygiene. Carefully wash all surfaces for 20 seconds and don't forget the thumbs. Next, carefully remove the face shield or goggles by grabbing the strap and pulling upwards and away from the head. Do not touch the front of the face shield or goggles. Remove and discard the respirator or face mask. Do not touch the front of the respirator or face mask. Perform hand hygiene after removing the respirator or face mask and before putting it on again if your workplace is practicing reuse. Facilities implementing reuse or extended use of PPE will need to adjust their donning and doffing procedures to accommodate those practices. Again, the CDC link at the bottom of the slide has more information. Next slide. 
Again, an infographic from CDC with the information regarding removal or doffing of PPE. Next slide. Some tips for face masks. When you put on a face mask, perform hand hygiene and put the face mask on where it covers your mouth and nose fully. When wearing a face mask, don't wear it under your nose or mouth. Don't cross the straps or allow them to hang down. Don't touch or adjust the face mask without performing hand hygiene before and after. Don't wear your face mask on the top of your head, around your neck, or threaded through your arm. And when you remove your face mask, clean your hands and remove by touching only the straps or ties, then perform hand hygiene again. Next slide. Again, a CDC infographic on these face mask recommendations. Next slide. Because there are often questions regarding optimizing PPE when there are supply shortages, and due to our time constraints, I've added some resources on this topic here from CDC. Next slide, please. And Lisa, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Susan. Now we would like to conduct an open discussion and Q&A session. To submit a question, click on the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and type in your question. Please be aware we will get to as many questions as we can in the time allowed. If we do not get to your question, we will answer any remaining questions after the event and post those to our QIOprogram.org website. As a reminder, along with the speakers today, we have Kathleen Lawrence and Sheila Hans from the Division of Nursing Homes at CMS available to answer questions as well. I would also take this opportunity to remind you to please complete the post-event survey. The link will be posted in the Q&A box during the open training discussion and will also be available immediately after the conclusion of today's training. So let's pull up our first question. And the first question is, if I have an admission with two negative tests and a negative test on admission, should I still isolate for 14 days? This is Eli. I'll chime in and just say that it, it depends on your local guidance, but many nursing homes would still isolate and place that resident or new admission in a transition unit and monitor for signs and symptoms for 14 days, just in abundance of caution. Even with a negative test, it could be early in the illness progression. Um, and we do know that there are sometimes false negatives. Uh, so as I mentioned before, you'd wanna coordinate with your local health department, but using a transition unit and placing that resident in those precautions for 14 days would be protecting your other residents that are still COVID-19. Mm -hmm. um, hello, this is uh, Kathleen Lawrence from CMS. I, I would echo what was just said, and that's basically what the CDC guidance remains um, with, with the uh, isolating new admissions, uh, because you don't know the timing of the test. The test was done, and they remained in the hospital for several more days before the admission. Um, so basically, testing is really um, used more like if, if they have testing at the end of the 14 day period, that would just increase certainty that the resident's not infected. So you would, you know, if they did not have any symptoms during that 14 day time period. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen and Eli. Mm -hmm. uh, the next two questions come from Sandy and they came in during Susan's um, presentation. So Susan, these are probably gonna go to you. Uh, the first part is why can't PPE be adjusted during care? And the second part of the question is why can't you cross the straps on a face mask? Thank you, Mary. I think the, the answer to these is similar in that the potential for contamination is high. You have to remember that when you put on PPE and go into a contaminated space, so for example, where there is no positive uh, COVID-19, um, everything becomes what we consider um, dirty. So if you're reaching with your gloved hands 
to adjust your face mask, the potential to touch your face, or, um, or other parts that have not become contaminated becomes a, a stronger possibility. So you have to think about it as almost like if you were using um, a, it's not really a sterile uh, procedure, but you're trying to keep uh, clean things clean and dirty things away from the clean things. Um, I, I certainly invite my colleagues to chime in on how we want to um, uh, answer and emphasize this if there's other uh, comments to add to that. I would just I will put in that. that. You have to adjust things, but you would have to remove your gloves do hand hygiene, make those adjustments, do hand hygiene again, and, and uh, re reapply gloves. Go ahead, Eli. I was just going to say about the straps, you know, if you were wearing a respirator and you don't have the straps on, a, on appropriately, it can change the, the points of pressure so there's not a good seal being created. That's why you have to be careful on, on how you use the straps. Uh, Eli and Susan, this is Lisa. Um, there's another question um, that it really pings right off of this, so it might need more clarification, so I'll read it. When wearing uh, N95 masks, they are made to be ear loops, not around the head. Some person's heads are smaller. Oh, hold on, the question just went away. Some person's heads are smaller and the loops are a little stretchy, so in order to not have the mask constantly slipping below the nose, some have crossed the loops around the ear. So I don't know if either of you would comment on that. I would just say that, that that could be common and with the ear loops, what you can do is tie a small like knot at the end of the loop to tighten that up. Uh, of course, you would not want your mask to go down below your nose because it's defeating the purpose. So, you know, for me, those are actually a little too tight, so I have to stretch that a little bit. So you just want to make sure that you're getting a good seal. That's the crucial component of it. I agree. Thank you, Eli. Okay, uh, we've got another question from Maria, and uh, this one I believe Eli has answered on a previous uh, training. It is um, any special guidance for dietary departments as far as PPE use and disinfection when employees in dietary tested positive for COVID-19? This is actually a fairly common question we're getting in, you know, in dietary, uh, you want to make sure that your employees are, are using source control, that they are cleaning surfaces just the same way that you have your clinical staff members doing that. If they're leaving that area and going into general care areas, they have a similar risk of transmission. You want to make sure that they have an EPA registered disinfectant that is effective against COVID-19. Um, so Deb shared a great link that you can look those products up, but it also has to be safe for use in a kitchen area. There's minimal chances of contamination um, on those food service items, as long as your dishwasher and your cleaning chemicals are appropriately diluted and your dishwasher's hitting that temp and time that you need to hit. So I would say that, yes, it's a concern that the dietary person tested positive. Um, if they're symptomatic, I assume you're putting them off work. Um, and I would just reinforce the importance of all the other staff members doing that source control cleaning and making sure that they're cleaning the resident um, food items or their dishes appropriately. All right, thank you. Our next question is, our facility has no COVID case at this time and we are trying to utilize our PPEs. Administrative staff are wearing cloth masks. Is that okay? I'll chime in, I guess, again, this is Eli. Uh, the CDC doesn't recognize cloth masks for healthcare workers as being um, protective equipment, but this is administrative staff. Uh, my understanding would be that they would not be coming in direct contact with um, patients or residents. So you would just have to analyze their level of risk, who they're interacting with, and make your decision based on the available personal protective equipment you have. What you'll find is one is hopefully you never have a positive or suspected resident, but if you do, you can burn through your personal protective very 
quickly. So I would use the CDC's um, PPE burn rate calculator to get an idea of what you would burn through um, on, let's say, one resident or two residents, and then that will let you know uh, where you have to maximize your PPE use. If you have enough uh, for them to be using a, 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 a surgical mask, then that would be more protection than a cloth mask, but it's really um, the situation you're facing within your facility and your community um, that's going to make that final determination. And Deb or somebody else on the team may have another opinion. Eli, this is Susan. Thank you for chiming in. Um, I agree with what you said, and just in addition to that, I would also say that you probably should be aware of any uh, local or state uh, guidance where you are and in relation to how the, um, the disease is in your community as well as in your facility, as Eli suggested. Um, this is Kathleen from CMS. Also, um, just to reiterate, uh, I think the CDC uh, doesn't consider cloth face coverings as PPE, personal protective equipment. So if that's what's indicated for the situation, then the cloth face mask wouldn't be appropriate. But you said if it's administrative staff not working with uh, residents where it wouldn't be PPE wouldn't be necessary, then that may be permit permissible. Great. Thank you, Kathleen. I think we have sure. a time for one more question. And this one comes from Christopher. He asks, if transmission occurs within a wing or area of a facility, should full PPE then be used in the entire facility? So this is this is Deb. I'll take a first stab at it, and then my colleagues can jump in. Um, and I'm I'm assuming that they are talking about that they have a COVID positive wing, which is where the COVID positive residents would be cohorted, and full PPE would be used in those cases. But if, you, if you're separating them and then you have a wing where you aren't housing COVID positive patients, you would not be using that full PPE um, just to be on those floors. Then you would, take, you would just take into consideration if they are on some type of transmission precaution, it would be the PPE that you need for that particular transmission precaution when you go in to do patient care. Universal masking is out there, so everyone would still just be wearing their face mask, and in that case, it would not be the cloth face covering for staff who are on the unit. But you wouldn't have to do the rest of it for your COVID, like you would for your COVID care unit. Do you think that's what they were asking? That, that's what I was thinking through, Deb, when you jumped in. Thank you it's, again, it's Susan. I, I was trying to think what are the variables there related to the, the, the question, the wing or the, the section, but um, I agree there are, if the wing is closed off and you're, you, you would use your full PPE in that COVID positive wing, but if the other area has no cross contamination, if it's sealed off, I'm, I guess what I'm saying, I, yes, you would wear the mask for your other non-COVID residents that are not in the hot area. All right, thank you so much, presenters. And next slide, please. Thank you for your participation in today's call. A special thanks to our speakers and a special thanks to our CMS colleagues for joining us during the Q&A portion of the event. We hope you found value in the topics discussed. Please do take a moment to complete the survey from today's event. You will be sent directly to the survey at the conclusion of the training presentation. Thank you again, and this concludes today's call. That concludes today's webinar. You will now be disconnected.